In a year of momentous happenings, 1995 saw the return of terrorism to the US and ethnic cleansing in the Balkans, while orbiting space station crews were setting records for endurance. In April, a huge car bomb tore apart a federal building in Oklahoma City, USA. The blast that had stunned the country brought mayhem and horror to an unlikely target in the heart of quiet middle America. US President Bill Clinton, fighting to control his anger, condemned the perpetrators of the blast as evil cowards and vowed they would be brought to justice. The federal building housed several US agencies in the front line of the fight against crime and terrorism, including the FBI and the Secret Service. The blast blew away an entire wall of the building, gutting several floors and sending bullet-like glass shards flying through city streets. There were scenes of panic on the streets as bleeding people staggered, screaming and shouting from the gutted building. Firefighters said that they could still hear cries of help from people trapped under the rubble. A United States Army veteran, Timothy James McVeigh, was later convicted of the bombing and subsequently executed in 2001. His act, which had claimed 168 lives, was the deadliest event of domestic terrorism in the United States and the deadliest act of terrorism within United States borders until the September 11, 2001 attacks. In space, 1995 was a momentous year for the crews of the Russian space station Mir and the US shuttle Atlantis. Russian cosmonaut Valery Polyakov returned to Earth, touching down on the snow-swept steppes of Kazakhstan after a record-breaking 438 days in space. Polyakov, a doctor, had broken the endurance record of one year in space in January and was one of only five people who had then spent more than 300 days in space. In his orbits in Mir, he travelled some 400 million kilometres, the equivalent of a return trip to the Sun or seven times the distance to Mars. Polyakov studied the effects of long-term weightlessness on the human body using himself as a guinea pig. Later in the year, the US shuttle Atlantis docked with the Russian space station Mir, uniting the two former Cold War adversaries in a new era of cooperation. The Atlantis commander, Robert Hoot Gibson, glided the shuttle smoothly into a docking port on the station as the two craft, traveling at 28,000 kilometers an hour, passed high above Central Asia near Russia's border with Mongolia. But the Russian and US space crews on both vessels had to wait another two hours to greet each other and make history because the shuttle had to be firmly secured to Mir first. US Vice President Al Gore and Russia's Prime Minister Viktor Chernomedin watched the docking at the communications center in Moscow's President Hotel. In the Middle East, a lone gunman assassinated Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin as he left a huge peace rally in Tel Aviv. Rabin, 73, a former general and Nobel Peace Prize winner, died in a Tel Aviv hospital just 90 minutes after addressing the rally. The alleged killer was 25-year-old law student Yigal Amir, a Jew who confessed at the scene telling police, I acted on God's orders and I have no regrets. At a later trial, Amir was sentenced to life in prison. Not aware that nuclear testing had become a dirty word, French President Jacques Chirac rejected a plea from Japan and Australia to halt the planned nuclear tests in the Pacific. He said France would proceed with its plan to stage eight more nuclear weapons tests on Mururoa Atoll before ending tests for good. As ethnic tensions were rising in the Balkans, the United Nations Tribunal on Human Rights charged 21 Bosnian Serb commanders with genocide and crimes against humanity. In a year of momentous happenings, 1995 was a year that also saw the Dalai Lama proclaim six-year-old Gendi Techi Nima as the 11th reincarnation of the Panchen Lama. The six-year-old was promptly arrested by the Chinese government and has not been seen in public since 1995. Truly a year of momentous happenings. 1996, a year of momentous happenings that sadly saw the death of two of the world's leading lights. At the age of 78, Ella Fitzgerald, the First Lady of Song, passed away after a 60-year career, and later in the year, one of America's leading scientists, Carl Sagan, who was suffering from cancer, died after catching pneumonia. The French nuclear tests in the Pacific met with new resistance in 1996. 
When French President Jacques Chirac visited Pope John Paul, he may not have been expecting the Polish-born pontiff to remind him that a politician should conduct constant moral reflection. However, in St. Peter's Square, anti-nuclear protesters who gathered during Chirac's ceremonial reception were more direct, waving flags and banners saying, Chirac, listen to the Pope, stop nuclear testing, and no to nuclear testing. Anti-nuclear demonstrations continued across the globe from Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., to the disarmament conference at the UN headquarters in Geneva, where Greenpeace called for an immediate ban on nuclear tests. We are here in front of the United Nations building because we would like to demonstrate that um, concerning the comprehensive test ban treaty, time is very short now. There is only a period of seven weeks left to get the treaty finished, and we urge all the delegates from all over the countries to make an end to nuclear testing and to sign the treaty now to get the treaty ready for this year. Although the French had recently provoked international outrage by staging a series of six underground nuclear tests in the Pacific, now that the United Nations had approved a nuclear test ban, there was a change of tack in Paris. I think it's an important step toward a safer world. Uh, perhaps there will be further steps, for sure, in uh, many uh, areas. But it's a very important step. Uh, all the um, official nuclear powers are embarked, the five nuclear powers. And uh, as you know, regarding France, we have already closed down our uh, nuclear testing facilities in uh, Muroroa, and uh, we already signed a uh, nuclear free zone in uh, South Pacific. So that, uh, that is an example of the strong commitment of the French government in favor of uh, the, uh, the effective implementation of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. But for sure, we'll have, uh, in, the fourth, in the future, all the steps. And uh, we'll always be uh, ready to, to discuss about uh, further disarmament in the world. As if by coincidence, France had ended 25 years of reliance on land-based nuclear missiles. It shut down 18 land-based nuclear missiles at an underground launch base and left its nuclear defense to weapons aboard submarines and bombers. The ceremony began when two pairs of officers, in separate bunkers 40 kilometers apart, handed back keys and launch codes that would have enabled them to fire the missiles on direct orders from President Chirac. Each of the 18 S-3D missiles had been equipped with a one megaton warhead and had a range of 3,500 kilometers, far enough to strike Moscow or beyond. Across the channel, Britain's beef industry was facing a major crisis. For the first time, the British government had admitted that mad cow disease, or BSE, could be transmitted to people. France was the first European country to order a ban on imports of British beef, and others soon followed. The speed with which the French authorities had ordered a ban on imports of British beef shocked traders at London's famous Smithfield meat market. One man said he'd lost 50% of orders in one morning. Britain's announcement prompted a slump in beef sales and a worldwide ban on British beef and beef products. Later, Paris supported the EU decision to ease a ban on beef products, but wanted Britain to do more to stamp out the disease before agreeing to a full lifting of the ban. Shops in Paris had started selling some of the previously banned beef products, including gelatin, tallow and bull semen. In a year that had also seen the war in Chechnya draw to an end, with the Russian President Boris Yeltsin declaring a ceasefire, 1996 was yet another year of momentous happenings. In a year of momentous happenings, 1997 was a year of justice, mourning and technology. Francis Jacques-Yves Cousteau, who had revealed to the world the mysteries of the ocean's depths, was laid to rest on land rather than buried at sea in the Navy tradition, according to his widow Francine. I think he has obliged people to open their eyes on very simple and important things. And he expressed that in such a way that everybody could understand it, from the taxi driver to the head of state. On the 31st of August 1997, the English Rose, Princess Diana, died tragically after a car crash in the Pont de l'Alma road tunnel in Paris. 
Short time later in India, the death of Mother Teresa provoked an outpouring of tributes from a world still reeling from Princess Diana's sudden death. With the passing of Mother Teresa, the world has lost one of the giants of our time. She served the poor, the suffering, and the dying. And in so doing, she served as an inspiration and a challenge to all the rest of us. With the power of her humble and unconquerable faith, she touched the lives of millions of people in India, here in the United States, and throughout the world. In Paris, self-proclaimed professional revolutionary Carlos the Jackal was brought to trial for the 1975 killing in Paris of two French secret agents and a Lebanese informer. Carlos, who had been linked to some of the most spectacular guerrilla acts of the 1970s, was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. In space, the orbiting Russian Mir station suffered from the effects of a fire and a collision, whilst the brightest comet event in history graced our skies. Comet Hale-Bopp was the most widely observed comet of the 20th century, and one of the brightest seen for many decades. It was visible to the naked eye for a record 18 months, twice as long as the previous record holder, the Great Comet of 1811. The passage of Hale-Bopp was notable also for inciting a degree of panic about comets not seen for decades. Rumours that the comet was being followed by an alien spacecraft gained remarkable currency and inspired a mass suicide among followers of a cult named Heaven's Gate. In what seemed to be an end to the Russian-Chechnya conflict, Chechnya's first post-war president, Alan Muskadov, took office, pledging to realise the dream of independence from Russia. Muskadov, a former Soviet artillery colonel who led separatist rebels against Russian troops sent to crush them in December 1994, also promised to strengthen the Muslim religion and fight a crime wave in the shattered region. Behind him, on the stage of the suburban assembly hall, stood leaders of the rebel force, which humiliated the Russian military during the 21-month conflict. When Muskadov had finished his inauguration speech, hundreds of men fired their Kalashnikov rifles into the air. Maskadov promised to bring the various armed groups in the region into line and to protect Chechnya's Russian population. The world's best chess player and the most powerful chess playing machine at the time were set to resume their historic battle in a rematch between Brain Cell and Computer Chip. The game was between Grandmaster Garry Kasparov, the 34 year old Russian who had been the world chess champion since 1985, and IBM supercomputer Deep Blue. It was one of the most eagerly anticipated rematches ever. The rivalry had begun 15 months earlier in Philadelphia, when Kasparov defeated the machine over six games after a stunning loss in the first. Kasparov thought Deep Blue would be tough to beat, but he was confident that he would win. The winner was to receive 700,000 US dollars, the loser 400,000 US dollars. The updated version of Deep Blue defeated Kasparov 3.5 to 2.5 in the highly publicized six-game match. The match was even after five games, but Kasparov was crushed in game six. This was the first time a computer had ever defeated a world champion in match play. 1997, a year that saw advancements in computer technology and the passing of much-loved lives was truly a year of momentous happenings. In a year of momentous happenings, 1998 was a year of accusations of presidential sexual dalliances and a new European economy. Early in the year, Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat was probably glad the attention was not on him at this photo opportunity with the slightly crimson American president, Bill Clinton. Let me say, first of all, I want to reiterate what I said yesterday. The allegations are false and I would never ask anybody uh, to do anything other than tell the truth. Let's get to the big issues there uh, about the nature of a relationship and whether I suggested anybody not tell the truth. Those, that is false. Needless to say, that wasn't the end of it, with the scandal continuing throughout the year and into the next, with an impeachment trial before the U.S. Senate early in 1999. Later in 1998, President Clinton had other matters on his mind when the United States and Britain launched airstrikes against Iraq, saying Baghdad would never cooperate with UN arms inspectors, and President Saddam Hussein urged Iraqis to fight back. US President Bill Clinton said in a televised address the attacks were aimed at Iraqi military and security targets. 
U.S. and British forces hit the Iraqi capital after Saddam put Iraq on a war footing and air raid sirens alerted residents. At least one blaze broke out and anti-aircraft fire lit up the night sky. U.S. officials said more than 200 aircraft and 20 warships, including 15 B-52 bombers, were deployed in the Gulf region carrying more than 400 cruise missiles and other bombs. Earlier today, I ordered America's armed forces to strike military and security targets in Iraq. They are joined by British forces. Their mission is to attack Iraq's nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons programs and its military capacity to threaten its neighbors. Their purpose is to protect the national interests of the United States and indeed the interests of people throughout the Middle East and around the world. Saddam Hussein must not be allowed to threaten his neighbors or the world with nuclear arms, poison gas, or biological weapons. The United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan saw the gravity of the situation. My thoughts tonight are with the people of Iraq and with the 307 United Nations humanitarian workers who remain in the country and with all others whose lives are in danger. In another momentous happening of 1998, legal history was made when a defiant Augusto Pinochet refused to recognize the jurisdiction of a London court as the former Chilean dictator appeared in a wheelchair to fight what he called the lies of Spain. The former head of state, who ran Chile with an iron fist, was forced to appear in a London court. While visiting the United Kingdom for medical treatment, Pinochet was arrested on a Spanish provisional warrant for the murder in Chile of Spanish citizens while he was president. Five days later, Pinochet was served with a second provisional arrest warrant from the Spanish judge Baltasar Garzon, charging him with systematic torture, murder, illegal detention and forced disappearances. The case was a watershed event in judicial history, as it was the first time that a dictator was arrested on the principle of universal jurisdiction. In Northern Ireland, Belfast was giving peace a chance in 1998 at its annual arts festival, against a new backdrop of hope after the Good Friday Peace Accord. As bridges were being built between divided communities, organisers were taking the message of reconciliation to the youth of Northern Ireland with two sister festivals, Young at Art and The Fringe. From puppetry, painting and circus workshops to avant-garde comedy, and a play set in a 200-year-old toilet, there was plenty to entertain children and those who liked their art with an itch. Come year's end, at Frankfurt's Euroball, the European banking fraternity celebrated the end of 1998 and the start of the age of the Euro, the currency that was expected to bring new power and international influence to the European Union. As yet another year of momentous happenings, 1998, was drawing to a close, residents of Frankfurt were treated to a light and fireworks show to mark the birth of the Euro. Thank you.